in between his sets, I just went up to him. And I said, if it's okay, sir, I just like to shake the hand of a guy who worked with my favorite bass player ever. That's he awesome. Leans over, he puts his hand on my forearm, he goes, So you a Jameson man. So Motown worked on a core of studio musicians when right. they were in Detroit. And it was and the same guys. And this is the 60s when Jamerson was there. So Correct. almost every chartable hit from Motown, whose fingers are on that bass? Like 95% right. or more of their number ones is James And Jamerson. they didn't list the players they, back nope. then. Right? No, no. It was all about the vocalists because right. they were vocal groups. Right. And that time was different, certainly, from what, what we did where we wrote our songs and we did our things. You know, at that time, the producers brought in the song in whichever of the Motown artists they thought best fit a song. They would bring that in, and then the musicians were always there. And here's the chord charts, and these guys had run through something two or three times, and then they'd start playing. And within two or three takes, you have the hits that you still listen to to Today. this day. Originally, they weren't writing out bass lines. Jamerson improvised all those things by the second or third time through just off reading the chord charts. And, I mean, it's it's it, it, virtuosity beyond anything. And even, you know, we talk about John Entwistle. He didn't know who James Jamerson was, but he knew it was all the same guy. He talked about, you know, Oh, so he didn't know that Jamerson, yeah. he didn't know him no. by name, but the, he could tell by all those Motown hits because correct. he's an artist of the bass. Correct. That, that, that the same guy was playing that. He talked about that guy that plays for Tamla, which was the name of the Motown label in England. In Langdon, yeah. You know, uh, McCartney. Learned from Jamerson. You know, they all listened to that stuff. You know, Bill Wyman, I mean, they covered Motown songs. Right, right. You know, they all were listening to him. Motown, you can you can understand from a business standpoint, mm -hmm. they don't want to tell anyone any of the musicians exactly. are. They don't want another label to come and get Jamerson. That was their secret weapon. Exactly. You know, and I started after we talked yesterday, I started to rewatch the movie Standing in the Shadows of Motown, which interviews a bunch of the old Motown artists. And they, they talk at one point to Joe Hunter, who I had the privilege to meet. He played at a club oh, downtown. I didn't know. And like, I didn't, I didn't even care what he was playing. I'm like, he played with James. I right. got I to gotta go. Right. In between his sets, I just went up to him. I said, if it's okay, sir, I just like to shake the hand of a guy who worked with my favorite bass player ever. That's he awesome. Leans over, he puts his hand on my forearm. He goes, so you a Jameson man. And I like, that almost made me cry. Right. Just because, you know, I don't even, you know, I would say I was a serviceable bass player. I, don't, I would not say I was an innovative anything. So, you know, I started listening to Motown constantly. Especially after you hurt your knee. In fact, our sound man, Bill, made me a cassette of the Temptations Best hits on one side. Why you're in an alt top punk band on the in other. the 80s. I just want Correct. to make that clear to everybody. Correct. He's in an alt punk band in the 80s inspired by the Sex Pistols and the Clash and the Who. And now you're totally into Motown and Temptations. Uh, in between records. This is in between the first record and the second record. Correct. 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 You know, it just, you know, I went in for my knee surgery and I'm in there for three days and you I'm just on listening Valium, to though, these cassettes. Well, they had, I had a Valium drip. You had a drip. The, and it, when I left, literally... All right, I remember my left visiting thumb, the you. The ball of my hand was bigger. I know because I'd done nothing but exercise well, my that, thumb for three that days. That was your Jamerson. That that was your that was your. That secret. was the thing. It was a grip. Yeah. It was a grip thing <laughs> on the neck. But yeah, so he totally and and if you listen to things on the second record and some demos that we did that mm -hmm. that never got recorded that didn't get recorded. Um, Panic Bar, mm -hmm. that song, That's my the bass, and that exists because of him. Uh, the bass in Struggle exists because I listened to Jamerson. Understanding the groove of that is why it's not as Jamerson-esque in, I mean, let me rephrase that. It's not as blatant a ripoff of Jamerson as the other two I just mentioned, but even One Last Wish, mm -hmm. understanding how to find a groove there is mm -hmm. because I listened to nothing but Motown and, and revisited everything. <laughs> 